the first thing I'd like to do is just pray. Let's pray. Uh, let's pray that the seminar would be a blessing to everyone that decided to come to the seminar. Heavenly Father, we come before you this beautiful day, Lord, and we thank you for the fellowship that we've already had. Thank you for the word that we've already heard. Father, you gave us your word, and uh, you, you say in your word for us to live by your word. So I pray that the seminar would be helpful. Father, I pray that you'd please help me to teach well and help uh, these young people that are here to understand uh, some of the principles that we should use when we approach your word. We thank you. We praise you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, you can sit down. Uh, if you've ever been to a seminar that I've done, you know I'd li I like to give out gifts. I love to give out books, and the way that I like to do that is, as I'm giving them out, I like to get to know you a little bit more. So, wh how about this? Uh, first thing that's important for me is your age. I want to know the age range, okay? So, let's do this. This first book, uh, Knowing God, which is considered a Christian classic, I'm going to give out to the youngest person here, but let's do it like this. So, if you are, let's say, 20 years or younger, please stand up. If you are 20 years and younger, please stand up, okay? Okay, if you are 18 years and younger, please remain standing. Everybody else, please sit down. If you are 18 and younger, if you are 16 and younger, please remain standing. And you're like, oh man, you're making me stand out. Everybody knows my age. Okay, uh, how about this? Um, if you are 15 and younger, okay, remain standing if you're younger. Uh, 14. Okay, we just lost almost everybody. Uh, 13. Okay, one brother is, okay, I, so everybody sat down. So there were some that were 13. Everybody who's 13, please stand up. And you guys are going to have to arm wrestle for it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, how about this? Uh, out of the three that are 13-year-old, who wants this book to read? Raise your hand. And I should have asked that first. So if you don't want a book, don't stand up at all, okay? Okay, 14-year-old, and you want this book, please raise your hand. There you go. Joseph, here you go. Someone, Carol, can you help me give this? Or maybe we should make Joe do it since he just got a book. Okay, let's talk about oldest here. And you're like, once again, oh, man, I was going to fit in here and, you know. Uh, okay, if you're 20 or, old, or older, uh, you're at least 20. Stand up, please. Okay, 22. Re remain standing if you're 22 or above. 24. 26. 28. 30. 32. I gave this brother a book at the, the retreat. I think the same exact question. And I actually have the same exact book. So, brother, I'm sorry. Uh, let's do this. John, I'll give you this book, okay? It's called What is Biblical Theology? Written by a professor at a seminary that I attend. Now, these I'm just going to give out because I don't have time to ask a lot of questions. That gives me a range, and that gives you guys a perspective. There are people here that are 13 years old, and there are people here who are 30. And that's the challenging uh, aspect of being teaching at a, teaching at a conference, young, young adults conference. So let's do this. I have, uh, since we're talking about how to study the Bible, one of the most beautiful things is we're not alone. Uh, we have others, other Christians, brothers, sisters, who also love to study the Bible, and God has gifted them in such a way to write books. So what I like to do when I give out books is not just to give out a book that's a certain topic, but I like to familiarize you with some good Christian authors. So these two are going to go to two girls because these two are written by two ladies. Uh, one is my favorite theologian and writer, Jen Wilkin. I don't know if you guys ever heard of her. This is her new book, Ten Words to Live By. It's a about the Ten Commandments, and this one is by another theologian who I love, and that's Nancy Guthrie, Nine Ways the Bible Story Changes Everything About Your Story. This one, Nancy Guthrie, is going to go to the person raise her, who ha raises her hand first. Okay, down the middle. I, I saw a hand down the middle. Uh, Alex, can you help me? Uh, the lady in the yellow dress, please raise your hand. Okay, who wants this one? Raise your hand. This, yeah, she was, she was on it. Uh, here you go. Here's another one. Carol, can you help? 
Yep, the lady in the, in the end there, okay? So having good people to read is a good idea. How about these two? I have two more, and then I have two more for later. This is a journal, okay? So one of the good practices when you're studying the Bible is actually to write as you're studying the Bible. So what this is, is it's a scriptural journal. So this is the book of Genesis, okay? Book of Genesis, as you're reading it in the ESV Bible version, and on the right, you have places to take notes. So I don't know how about you, or do you like taking notes in Scripture? I usually don't like to write in my Bible just because it's not enough space. This one, uh, there's plenty of space. So if you're studying the book of Genesis and you want this book, raise your hand. This uh, lady over here. So this is a scriptural journal, this lady here. Okay, and last one. Uh, This is written by another professor at the seminary that I attend. One of the hardest passages, uh, one of the hardest types of books in the Bible is the prophets. Uh, I don't know if you're a prophet scholar. One of the hardest uh, genres in the Bible to study is the prophets, right? Uh, There's a lot of imagery there. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of pictures there, and it's hard to understand. Uh, Peter Gentry, which is a Bible scholar, wrote a little book, it's tiny, it's called How to Read and Understand the Biblical Prophets. Anyone who is currently reading the prophets, any prophets, minor or major, and wants this book, please raise your hand. Gentleman in the back, super quick. Uh, Can you keep your uh, arm raised so he finds you? There you go. Okay, so uh, I like to give out books. I think books are powerful. Good books are powerful. Seminar, how to study the Bible. First of all, I thought I was going to be teaching in the other hall with a smaller group of people. (laughs) Uh, Now I'm in the big hall somehow. Um, But this is good. I'll be standing to the left here so we can look at some slides. And like I said, we have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to jump right in. Here's the interactive question that's first. Why study the Bible? Raise your hand if you have a version of an answer to that question. Don't be shy. This is meant to be interactive. Why study the Bible? It's a broad, broad answer. You, there's a lot of uh, broad question, a lot of answers. Go ahead, Vicky. To know more is to study. Nathan? To grow in your faith, sir. To get to know God, to get to know God and who he is. Okay, sir, in the middle. Exactly. Who, where, where, do we, where do we go? You have life, right, Peter says. Who, who else? Any other answers? Alex? To teach, to reprove, so the scriptures are formative in our life. Okay, thank you. That's a really good reason. Okay, anybody else? Okay, so here is, uh, this is going to be an introductory uh, type of seminar. Uh, Just think of this, uh, imagine, imagine if there was a lecture on the study of butterflies. And this knowledgeable professor came here and he spoke everything about butterflies. Uh, And... People who want to know about butterflies came and listened. This is not that at all. Okay, first of all, butterflies are not that interesting compared to the Bible. I just offended like 30 people that catch butterflies. Um, The Bible is much more interesting. And second of all, I'm not that expert. So I don't want to stand up here and say that I have the golden key or I'm some sort of scholar exegete that I know all the answers to the Bible and how to study. That's not what this seminar is about. This seminar came about from a conviction that I have in my heart, and that conviction is that the Bible is actually hard to study. The Bible is not an easy book to actually study. It's, it's not effortless. Now, you have to balance that with this is a book that gives life, right? And we experience with the Bible what we never experienced with any other book. There is that. And it's amazing to just read the Bible for your enjoyment, But to be honest, when you approach the Bible and you open your Bible, sometimes it's hard. And my conviction is that an average Christian struggles with how do you even approach Scripture? How do I get that meaning out of the text that these preachers are talking about? When I open my Bible, I don't see what that preacher was doing there up there. And there's a disconnect. There's a gap. That's the conviction that was in my heart when I started to think about how to study the Bible. And I'm learning myself, and this is just some information that I've been able to gather. This is, again, introductory, okay? This is not supposed to be know-it-all, but let's start. 
When you approach a passage of the Bible, here's my answer to why study the Bible. Okay, and all your answers were correct and they were good. When you open up a passage of Scripture, what you're trying to get from it is meaning. That meaning is what you understand about God, about yourself. It could be many different layers to that meaning. When we take a text and we just read it, the meaning is very narrow. Why study the Bible? For that meaning to become bigger. Okay, so what do I mean by that? I actually have a picture for you, okay? I'm going to give you five seconds to see this picture, and let's see if you can derive any meaning for it from it for yourself. This is my favorite painting. You can't see it that well, <laughs> but I can see it up there really well. Um, one of the lights down. It's okay. It's, you can see the details. So 10 seconds, okay? Um, it was less than 10 seconds. Um, meaning. Now, you might have just looked at that painting and thought, okay, beautiful painting, beautiful waves, awesome looking water. Uh, there's a sun in the background. There's someone in the middle trying to do something. Now, here's what I want to show you. That's, that's what it feels like when you just read the Bible. I want to show you a little bit, demonstrate to you what it means to study the Bible. Now, let's do it together. Uh, the... What if I told you the name of the painting was by a Russian artist? That connects you a little bit, doesn't it? I don't know if you've ever been to a museum. You're walking around. You see all these people, great Italians, drawing beautiful things. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, Ivan Ivazovsky. Hmm, must be Russian. Connection, right? Um, but maybe not that much meaning, but somewhat, right? What if I told you that, um, what if I told you that in the middle there, the mast that's left from the ship is in the shape of a cross? And for a reason. What if that was intentional by the author? What if I told you that the name of the painting is called the Ninth Wave? Now, that might ring a bell for you, or it might not at all. Let me explain. What is the ninth wave? Well, in all, uh, in all worlds where there are a lot of ships, and there's a lot of fishing in little towns, and men go out to sea a lot, and they live on the sea, there's this idea that the ninth wave is the largest. Okay? It's just, it's a mystical way of kind of thinking about it, but... Either way, these men or women, maybe in the middle of them, are trying to survive, and the painting is called the ninth wave. In other words, the biggest wave is coming, and it's right behind them, actually. You see it in the back. It's coming. Now, what if I told you uh, to look at the sun? Is it a sunset, or is it a sunrise? What would the mean, how would the meaning change? Uh, well, it, it's a sunrise. Uh, the reason uh, that he paints the sunrise is it's hope. The ninth wave is coming. Here we are on a cross, and we battled all night for our lives. And let's say a ship that big could have had 200, 300 men on it, and there's only five left hanging on for dear life. And if you, you can't really see it there, but one of the guys is almost falling off, and the other guy is holding on to him. The painting just means more now, doesn't it? What if I told you that the guy you can see in the middle is raising his hand, and he's raising a hand with a, scarlet, with a scarlet cloth in his hands? And people studying this uh, painting have uh, tried to see what, what could it mean. Well, and there's a lot of versions. Uh, maybe the blood of Christ. You see what I just did there with the painting? You see how the painting now makes more sense? You see how now next time you see the painting, you're going to be much more familiar with it, and now you understand those people who are in museums and are standing and glaring at the paintings. And you just walk by, like, okay, cool, cool, cool painting. That's what happens. Now, there's a difference between studying Scripture and studying art. What is that difference? That difference is, well, art is actually uh, very interpretive by nature. 
you and I can have a different version of what this painting might mean. But Scripture is not so. You can't just approach a passage of Scripture and say, oh, what do you think? What does this passage mean for you? Because here's what it means for me. That's not the way to approach Scripture, but that's the difference between art. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at a passage, and at the end, we're going to come back to this passage. Right now, it's just like that first picture of the painting. I just want you to see it. And I know you know this verse. You've probably heard it before. And I'm kind of playing and hoping on that. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Uh, You probably heard this passage uh, probably many times in life. Um, What does it mean? We're going to come back to this passage. Here's what I'm actually going to do, and I think this is helpful. I hope it's not hurtful. (laughs) What we're going to do is actually step back, take the principles that I'm going to teach you about approaching Scripture, and we're going to apply those principles not to the Bible, but to another piece of literary work. Okay? We're not going to talk about the Bible for the first section, just to teach you the principles. And then at the end, we're going to take those principles and come back to this text. Does that make sense? So now I'm going to look at, we're going to look at a different literary uh, masterpiece. Um, But it's not going to be the Bible. So I don't want you going home and saying, they were teaching me not the Bible. (laughs) We are. I just think the principles are much more evidently seen when you apply the same principles to another piece of literature work. Okay? That's the idea. So, three aspects that I want to talk to you about. Again, this is introductory. Context, language, and history. Context, language, and history are the three things that we're going to look at. Now, really, context is part of language. So, these are not truly categories in themselves. It's like saying fruits, vegetables, pumpkins. Uh, But the reason I want to talk about context so much is because I believe it's one of the most important things when you approach Scripture to understand the meaning of the passage. So we're going to take context on its own. But really, uh, these are not real categories. These are just things we're going to think through. Okay? So context is really part of language. Uh, Now, the other piece is these don't have to go in this sequence. There is an art to studying the Bible. There's a science component to it here's what you should do and then there's an art you could take those principles and apply them how you want so three things context language history you could approach it from a historical perspective from a grammar perspective from context different different pieces i like my own version i like to go through certain pieces Uh, but just take these three there's no sequence to them okay so first context so if you're taking notes there are three aspects to context okay Um, close context Continuing context, complete context, okay? And there's actually more, but these are three that will just give you a ray. It'll give you a range so we could think through this, okay? So close context is, the question is this. The close context, the question is this. When you have a passage that you're studying, the question is, what is said immediately around the passage? Immediately, the, the key word is it's close context. What is said immediately around it? that might change or add to the meaning of the passage that you are studying, okay? So here is what we're going to look at. Here's the literary masterpiece. Mary had a little lamb. Uh, Maybe I missed it. Uh, Sometimes I feel too old, and I'm kind of like, I say things, and I was like, everybody knows this. Raise your hand if you have ever heard that statement. Mary had a little lamb. Perfect. Uh, That's a relief. Mary had a little lamb. What does this mean? What if Mary was in a Middle Eastern restaurant? Mary had a little lamb. What if little lamb is a nickname of a pet parakeet? Guys, what if Mary had a little lamb as a code statement for the U.S. Navy SEALs? 10-4 10-4 over, Mary had a little lamb. What am I trying to show you? What am I trying to say? Um, you see, you were familiar with that statement, and maybe that's part of the problem. Mary had a little lamb. 
Now, the nursery that you probably heard is not this, but this is the poem uh, that was written, and then the nursery rhyme, Mary had a little lamb, was written from. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. He followed her to school one day, that was against the rule, and made the children laugh and play to see a lamb at school. And so the teacher turned him out, but still he lingered near, and waited patiently about till Mary did appear. And then he ran to her and laid his head upon her arm, and if he said, I'm not afraid, you'll keep me from all harm. What makes the lamb love Mary so, the eager children cry? Let me ask the question. Is this the complete or incomplete close context? You might not even know, so let me show you. It wasn't. <laughs> the, the ending thought was on the next page, and here it is. Here's the kicker. You see, you would have missed this kicker if you would have just stopped reading right there. Oh, Mary loves the lamb, you know, the teacher did reply, and you each gentle animal in confidence may bind. That's fascinating wording. And made them follow at your call if you are always kind. You see, we do this to Scripture all the time. When you are reading a passage, make sure that you outline the passage correctly. Where does the thought start? Where does it begin? You see, sometimes we take a verse completely out of context. This is a good timing. Brother, would you please stand up? Everybody needs to sh read his shirt. His shirt says, I can do all things. Can you open it up a little bit so they see it? I can do all things through a verse taken out of context. Some of you might get that. Some of you may not. I really need that shirt. <laughs> it's an awesome shirt. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? And then people as boxers and put, their, put them on their, put it on their arm and, and fight and go hit other guys in the face. Uh, taking the verse out of context. Christ says, I have learned to live in poverty and in riches. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The context is different. Okay, so close context. Uh, make sure when you're looking at the passage, you're looking at a complete thought at least. Next, continuing context, what is said before or closely after the passage that impacts the meaning of the current passage? So you're moving this way. You're not looking at the immediate context you're expanding okay so let's see look at this i took this out of a, do out of a document the original document of where this book was printed i don't want to read um, the poems on the left and on the right side but notice on the left hand side notice the connection lambs birds what in the world is happening here why is it about animals uh, if ever I see on bush or tree young birds in a pretty nest, I must not in my play steal the birds away to grieve their mother's breast. My mother, I know, would grow sorrow, so should I be stolen away? So I'll speak to the birds in my softest words, not to hurt them in my play. See this? You guys see the trend between the two. I remember what the teacher said to, about Mary's little lamb? Be kind. So what is the theme that's developing here? Simply because you step back a little bit further and you see that the poem is actually part of a bigger context. The author is trying to do something a little bit bigger than even maybe the chapter or maybe even the book in the New Testament. Okay? Continuing context. In other words, it's continuing. There's a trend here. And lastly, complete context. La complete context. Is there a bigger context? You're, again, you're expanding out. Does the passage belong to a book that is part of many books? Okay, so you can't really see that. This is the cover of the book. Look what it says. Written to inculcate, you have to translate that word, semantics, right? Persistently instruct is the word <laughs> inculcate moral truths and virtues, virtuous sentiments. You see, the author had an intention. The author was writing this with an intention. So look what it says. Dear children, I wrote this book for you to please and instruct you. I know children love to read rhymes and sing little verses, but they often read silly rhymes, and such manner of spending their time is not good. I intended, when I began to write this book, to furnish you with a few pretty songs and poems which would teach you truths. 
You see, little children singing, Mary had a little lamb, have no, might not even have the idea that the author actually intended much more behind what's sang, right? I offer you the first part of the poems for our children. If you like these, I shall soon write the second part. I like that addition there. Okay, so that was context. Again, we're going to take the context. We're going to apply it to Scripture once I get through these principles. Uh, the next one is language. Language. Genre. Literary genre. What is the literary genre of the passage? How should that inform the reading of the passage? Now, Igor, what are you talking about? Uh, let me say this. The Bible is not like any other book. You're like, okay, thank you. That's new information. <laughs> um, you're going to say, amen, brother. The Bible is not like any other book. That's true. It is a supernatural book. It is the word of God. The Bible, on the other hand, is like any other book. What do I mean by that? Well, first common denominator, it uses words. It uses sentences. It uses chapters. It uses language. And the way that the Bible uses language is like in any other literary form, in any other literary masterpiece. Let me explain. When you are reading the, Bi when you're reading the newspaper, your brain automatically reads an obituary a certain way. Your brain does this almost unconsciously because it's supposed to be read a certain way. Now, your brain automatically shifts when you read the classified uh, section of the newspaper. Now, you guys are sitting here like, what's a newspaper? Uh, this is Craigslist. Okay, this is the old Craigslist. Your brain automatically switches and says, this is, this is classifieds. This is people trying to sell stuff, get renters in their home, right? When you read cartoons, the section in the newspaper, cartoons, your brain automatically shifts. Now, you're not reading the obituary the same exact way you're reading the cartoon, are you? How about sports news? How about front headline news. Why are they on the front? It's the most important thing to know. Your brain automatically knows how to switch and read different literary genres. The thing is, you know these type of genres. Now, in the Bible, why in the world do we not think the same way when we approach the Bible? Why do we read the Bible very linearly? Tell me, this is interaction. <laughs> what kind of literary genre is this passage? It's a parable, thank you. You know, there has been many, many, many wrong interpretations of Scripture done on parables. Because we try to read parables just like we read narrative. And that's a problem. Because the parable is not supposed to give you the detail that any narrative just gives you. You're supposed to approach reading a parable differently. You're not supposed to shake every single word for its meaning. You're supposed to look for that one statement that the parable is trying to teach. What about this? What literary genre? It's, it's on there. <laughs> Proverbs. It's a proverb, wisdom literature. It's poetry a lot of times. Now, when you open up any other literary genre, why am I doing this other masterpiece with Mary Had a Little Lamb? It's a poem. Now, why, when we open the Psalms, when we open the Proverbs, why do we approach it the same way that when we read, for example, narrative stories in the book of Genesis? It's wisdom literature. It's supposed to be read like poetry, like wisdom literature. Galatians, Paul, an apostle, not from men, not through men, but through Jesus Christ. It's a epistle or letter. It has, why does he start with saying, who is this? 
It's Paul. Who am I writing to? I'm writing to my brothers and sisters in Galatia. It's a letter. Every letter has an introduction. It has a main idea. It has an ending. You're supposed to approach it like a letter. 2 Samuel 1, 14. After the death of Saul, when David had returned from the striking down the Amalekites, this is called narrative. It's a story. The Old Testament is harder to study because the stories are much longer. You have to read a little bit longer, not to cut off the context, you see. An epistle might be a few, a few chapters and you're done. And that's the whole letter. But a story might go on, pages and chapters. How about this one? This one is fascinating to me. This is the one we struggle with the most. And let me explain to you why we struggle with it the most. Uh, let me ask you, if you know right away, don't answer right away. I want you to think. What genre, what literary genre is this? Okay, now if you know, you could answer. Apocalyptic literature. What in the world is that? Do you know that in the first century, people actually wrote in the literary genre of apocalyptic literature? If you want to get an example, um, go Google the, Her the Shepherd of Hermes. When you read it, uh, and actually it's a book that Christians read in the first century. They were considering it to be part of the canon, but it never made it. So this is not inspired text. But you can see that people wrote in this interesting literature called apocalyptic literature. You see, the problem is we don't write that way in the 21st century. Why do we struggle with the book of Revelations? Because this is foreign to us because we need to work harder to understand what is apocalyptic literature. Why so much imagery? What is this battle going on? What are these faces that were like human faces, right? You have to understand what you're reading. That's genre. Grammar. Interaction. I like this one. Tell me, what does this word mean? Green. Somebody just raise your hand and what does this word mean, Vicky? It, it describes a color. Okay, thank you. What else? What could it, what else could it mean? Back there, please. Plant life. Something is green. Who else? Tesla is green. Eco-friendly green. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. What is it? Go. Green means go. What else? Someone who is sick. Oh, man, that guy looks green. Go ahead, sir. What is it? Money. Do you have the greens? Go ahead, Alina. Ceramic stages. Oh, fascinating. That's a new one. Thank you for teaching me something. I've never heard that. Who else? Anybody else? Go ahead. A what? A young person. That guy is so green. He's out there drawing a, driving a car. Uh, he's green still. That's a Russian thing, by the way, right? Only shows you Yeah? That's not an English thing. You know what that is? That's called the semantic range of a word. The semantic range of a word. Why do we think sometimes, why do we sometimes take one word in the Bible and think that that's the meaning of that word in every single verse of the Bible. So what determines, what determines the meaning of the word? It's not only the intrinsic meaning of the word, but the context. You see, I'm kind of looping back, right? What is a sentence? A sentence is, it, it expresses a complete thought. At its minimal definition, it uh, expresses a complete thought, right? A period goes at the end of your completed thought, yeah? Now, English class, grammar, yeah? What do you do? What do you do with Paul's first, first chapter um, letter to the Ephesians? When verses 3 to 14 is one sentence, Try to catch where the period is. 
It's all the way at the end. There's comma and comma and comma and comma. It's not a completed thought until you get to the period. Now, how do you study this? Well, you have to study it just like this. And that's the hard part, right? Paul packs in so many things in this one section. It's hard. You have to take it by parts, but don't disconnect it because it's one sentence. Actually, uh, in the original language, this is still one sentence, and they say that this is the longest sentence. Talk about a run-on sentence, right? Uh, go, go back to your English teacher and tell her, well, what about Paul? He was a great, one of the greatest minds. You, you think I have a run-on sentence in my essay? Um, this might be the longest. Paul wrote longest sentences, longer sentences than compared to all the philosophers of his time. It just shows you the mind of Paul. He's, he's spectacular. So words, sentences. So what, is the, what do these words mean? And so the teacher turned him out. What in the world does that mean? You see, it's, it's an older verse. Uh, it's an older poetry, poem. The teacher took him outside. We don't say that, do we? He turned him out. What about this? What does this sentence mean? And you, each gentle animal in confidence, may bind. Now, we don't say that, do we? Go bind your animal with confidence. Um, binding means uh, you also can take these animals in your hands. But, but only if you do what? If you are always kind. You see, the kids were jealous of Mary because... The lamb kept coming, and she was kind to the animal. But you see, there's, there's so much to even studying something that's, I don't know, 50, 100 years old, longer. What about 2,000 years? I told you a million times. Now, everyone in here, if I told you that, you automatically know that it's not literally a million times, right? It's called a hyperbole. When you over-exaggerate something to prove a point, right? Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And as many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. It's not even 77 times. It's seven multiplied by seven by seven. By, it's a... In other words, Peter, always, it's not meant for counting. Okay, I'm on number 400. Uh, okay, I could stop forgiving my brother. I'm drowning in homework. How can you literally drown in your homework? Um, and if, you ha if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Now, how many times have you heard people ask, well, do you literally cut it off or no? It's a hyperbole. It's language. Now, don't miss the power of the hyperbole. Jesus says, deal with it. How? How much do you deal with it? Cut it off. Extreme, extreme radical reaction to the sin that's caused, caused in your life. Don't miss the power of the hyperbole. It's not supposed to say, well, it's just a hyperbole. No, but you could understand what he's talking about. It's a hyperbole. It's not rocket science. How about idioms, right? They're fascinating. You blind guides straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. We don't say things like these, right? But we say it's not, a rocket, it's not rocket science. How about it's a piece of cake? What do I mean by that? Am I talking about sweet goodness for dessert? Of course not. It's easy. It's a piece of cake. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs. Don't give to people what they will not be able to appreciate, right? Say, what does that mean? It's an idiom. What's the point? Language is gloriously complex. Translation. Now, this one, I have to tread on thin water. <laughs> okay? Okay. Uh, I'm not. I'm not a Bible scholar to give you the best translation. I just want you. I just want you. I just want to show you a principle. Okay, and I hope if if you think it's correct, take it. If you don't think it's not, you can have your own opinion. 
what is the best Bible translation to use? I just want to show you something. Thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Let me ask you, this is interactive. What does gird up thy loins mean? To get ready, who said that? Thank you. But you dress yourself for work. You see what the Bible translators of the ESV wanted to do. They, they did not, they did not compromise on theological truth. They did not change certain meaning of texts completely so it's against Christian orthodoxy. It's not that. They're just trying to make it more readable to you in your language. Working with the semantics. By his, I love this one. By his niecing, a light doth shine. It's talking about Leviathan in the book of Job. What does niecing mean? What do you think it means? What is it? Close. Niecing. Sneezing. You can see niecing, you see the morphology of language, right? It almost sounds like what you're doing. Niecing. Sneezing. How about seething pot? Hey, can you get uh, the seething pot off of the, uh, off of the kitchen counter, please? Boiling pot. You see what they're trying to do. They're trying to make the Bible more understandable to you. Now, again, I know I'm treading on thin water. I just want to show you this principle. This, by this spectrum, okay, by, by this principle, all Bible translators can be distinguished. Now, on the left-hand side, the principle is literal or formal equivalent. Uh, the translators thought it was more important to translate word for word rather than thought for thought. Now, why would they think that? Well, thought for tha thought for thought already introduces a layer of interpretation, doesn't it? Depends on who's translating, doesn't it? So, I want to encourage you to be more on the left-hand side, where the translation is word for word, and then the interpretation is left to the reader. Now, that's not 100% true, because any translation already uh, gets a level of some sort of interpretation. To translate a language, you have to interpret. But just this principle, thought for thought. Now, at some point, I don't know if you guys ever heard of the Message Bible. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just phrases, uh, functional equivalents, thought for thought. Uh, some of the examples are kind of ridiculous even. Um, now, I just want you to tell, I just want to tell you, go more towards the word for word or literal formal equivalent. Now, there's plenty of Bibles to choose there from. It doesn't have to be the King James. Actually, notice the King James is not even, it's towards, more towards the middle. The NASB, the ESV, those are good Bibles to use. But let me tell you, there is power in using the NIV Bible, for example. Now, I would recommend you read multiple Bibles to see what, to see what the passage is saying. That's just good practice. Uh, but just for your reading purposes, one year, read the NIV. One year, read the NASB. Another year, read the ESV. You could do that. Um, again, when we look at these men, we are super thankful. And we talk about these stories of these men. John Wycliffe, uh, first-hand written English Bible. He was the first to translate the Bible into the English language, and he died for it. What an honorable thing to do. What an honorable way to dedicate your life to what? To translating the Bible so people can understand it. What about William Tyndale, who picked up the work of John Wycliffe and continued to translate the Bible the first printed English Bible, the New Testament only, was done by William Tyndale. He used the newly in invented printing press, and he was printing Bibles so they could have them in English. Uh, that's what stemmed the Reformation. That's how we have Protestant people today. The Bible became more understood. Now, you might say, well, why didn't it just stay in Latin? You see, you have to be consistent with your logic. 
Uh, no one ever talks about Miles Coverdale, who was actually working with William Tyndale. It's interesting that he kind of falls off the radar. Um, he, he's the first one to print the whole Bible in English. These are English translators. Now, we look at these men and we say what they do is completely honorable. We, I think their lives are dedicated to this passion and they lost their lives. Um, how about these men? Do you know that ESV Bible translation, translation included a lot of people? The oversight committee, or the committee that was in charge, there was 13 people in, in it, and they were people from America, from Canada, from England, from Australia, professors from 10 different seminaries. That's just the oversight committee. That's the people that are leading. And actually, they didn't even, they took the RSV version, and they just made it more accessible in the ESV version. I'm not saying this is the Bible. I'm just, I just want to show you the process of how a Bible is translated. Now, why in the world do we honor these men and we don't honor these men who are dedicating their life to the interpretation of Scripture? On the left-hand side, that's one of my professors, Thomas Schreiner, one of the greatest uh, New Testament scholars uh, today. Fifty-one people for the review committee from America, from Australia, from Canada, Japan, England, France, Ireland, professors from 31 different seminaries. These are doctoral, uh, doctoral professors. These are doctors of theology that know the original language. And yet, they want to do it in a group. You see, it's committee. It's not just one person translating. So, I have a gift. If you were born in this country and you are reading the King James, and you just simply were never exposed to an ESV Bible, and this is not going to go against your conscience, who wants this as a brand new Bible, the ESV version? Sir, here you go. You raised your hand. Brand new Bible. That's the ESV Bible translation. Again, there's others. I'm not saying that's the translation. I just want to show you. History, last. If you were uh, in somewhere Middle East, and you were just walking around the cave, because that's what you do in the Middle East, uh, in, around Israel, and you just found this clay pot, and all of a sudden you went inside this pot, and inside this pot, pot is clay pot, is a scroll. Now, it's not the Bible, but it's some other ancient document. You take it to the experts, and the experts say, well, it's actually from the 3rd or from the 2nd, 3rd century. Let me ask you, how would you go about studying what's in this S script? What, what sort of questions would you ask about this scroll that's 2,000 years old? Well, at first, very basically simple questions, right? Who is the author? Who's he writing to or she? Who are they writing to? What are they trying to say? Right? Uh, why don't we approach the Bible that way? Sometimes. Author, who is the author of the passage? What did the author intend to say? That has meaning. Let me show you how. Mary had a little lamb. Our example, back at it, okay? Who wrote it? The statement is part of a nursery rhyme written by Sarah Josepha Hale. Now, listen to number three. Well, she was a teacher in a small school of young boys and girls. That's where she got the idea. But Mary had a little lamb. But three, she was an activist who defended women's rights. Interesting. Does that matter or does, not, not, does that not matter? Let's keep going. Audience. Who's the original audience of the passage? How did the original audience understand the passage? What did it mean to them? You see, when you take scripture, you have to first ask the question, what did this passage mean to the original audience? What did the author intend, and what did the people understand? Now, that takes work. But we're talking about studying the Bible, aren't we? Mary had a little lamb. Who are the audience? The original audience were parents who had small children. The statement is part of a nursery rhyme intended for parents to sing before bedtime. Small children were meant to hear the story and fall asleep over and over and over and over again. If you had kids, you know exactly what this is like. I have a three-year-old daughter, and she loves to hear a few, she goes from one story to another, but literally for months, 
Daddy, I want to hear that story, that story, that story. Remember what she wanted to do, Sarah, the author? Inculcate virtues in these young children. Culture. This is kind of the key. In what sort of historical culture was this written? What if it was written in a culture where lambs were considered unclean animals? Just like in the Bible, pigs are considered unclean. You see how that changes? That's a cultural aspect. Well, it's actually not just cultural, it's a scriptural aspect in the Old Testament, right? The original audience was early Americans. The original culture was just developing in the idea of nursery rhymes, so nursery rhymes were a big deal. It was the thing in teaching children. But notice number three. The original culture did not believe in a girl's right to go to school with boys or to go, in in a lot of cases, to go to school at all. Mary had a little lamb, and she brings it to school. Doesn't that change the meaning? You're you're never going to understand that nursery rhyme the same way. Let's come back. We have a few minutes. The passage that we started with, let's apply those same, again, not in the same order, just some of the principles, uh, and I want to leave this work to you. I don't want to just stand up here and exegete or explain the text to you, but I just want to show you a couple aspects of how you, would, how you should approach a text and study it. So first, right, those three aspects, context, language, history. Most scholars, most Bible scholars believe that the, in the original language the, or in the normal language, the, the Gospel of Matthew has a beautiful structure in it. There is an intended structure that Matthew, as he was writing, was trying to convey. And there are sections in his writing. He's very intentional about structuring this thing a certain way. So here, are every, almost everyone agrees that there are five major discourses. In other words, these discourses are teaching a certain aspect, and he's moving on, and he's building, and he's moving on. Notice the end is eschatology, meaning it's the end of times. Matthew is leading somewhere in his gospel. So talk about context, right? We just read a passage from chapter 18. The the continuing context, right, is the church community. In that fourth discourse, Matthew talks a lot about the church and the disciples, Now, you have to understand, the church is just forming with these men, right? Now, there was always a a community of believers, right, even in the Old Testament. But we're talking about something new, a church community. Christ is building his church. So Matthew dedicates a big section, two chapters, three chapters, to the church community. So that helps you think, who is this being addressed to, right? Right? Close context. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I, I truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. The context of the passage is church discipline. It's when brothers and sisters sin against each other. And to a point of when a person doesn't agree, when you approach somebody and you say, brother, sister, you sinned against me. And they don't listen. What does it say? It's a three-step process. You bring some more people, then you take it to the church, and if the person does not agree that they are in sin. Matthew says, this is Jesus that says, right? Um, If they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. 
It's a pretty harsh context. It's talking about one of the most difficult things about church life, and that is church discipline. When somebody gets uh, on some disciplinary matters, right? It's hard. That's the context of the passage. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree, so listen, verse 20, for where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. It's not that Christ is not in you when you're somewhere alone, hiking. It's that Christ is with you and he's with his church. That's the context. He's with his church. And whatever is happening in the church, even disciplinary actions, the church has authority to bind and loose on earth. And Christ is saying, when you are gathered in such a way for, for discipline, I am there with you. See, that's a, different, that's a whole different understanding than maybe understanding it to say, well, we can just gather for a small fellowship somewhere, right? But here is another beauty of the context. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the unforgiving servant, sandwich this passage in. This conversation happens between two parables. The parable of the lost sheep. What's that parable about? When the sheep is lost and then found. Right? How about the parable of the unforgiving servant? Well, that one, you remember that story. It's when a servant is unforgiving. When he was just forgiven a ton, he's refusing to forgive. So what is the bigger context of this passage telling you about church discipline? What is it telling you about church discipline? It's saying there should be grace in church discipline. There should, there should be forgiveness in church discipline. The people that do not repent of their sins, you should look at them as lost. You should pray for the lost. You should try to gain them back. And then when they do come back and they say, I'm sorry, I have sinned and I want to be returned into the community of the church, what do you do? You forgive. Because you don't want to be like the unforgiving servant. How many times, Peter asked in, verse, in chapter 18? 77 times. When a person comes genuinely, truly repenting, we are going to have the tendency not to forgive in our church because we are hard-hearted that way. Because the offense can be against you personally. What's Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, I am with you in this. You have to carry out church discipline. You have to be pretty consistent with it because that's a biblical teaching. But listen, you have to show grace. Now this, lastly, I'm wrapping up. What's this statement about bind on earth and bound in heaven. Well, here's another beauty of the Bible. The scripture interprets scripture. In verse 16, Jesus already said this. He said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom on kingdom of heaven. He's talking to his disciples in that passage. He says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth, notice same language. What is he saying? He is saying that the church gathering, the people that gather together as a church, have the authority, look what it says, the keys of the kingdom. Meaning the church has the authority to identify it as a gathering, not individual people on their own, as a church gathering. We have the authority to identify who's a Christian and who's not a Christian. That's why you get baptized into the church. That's why when you go through your lessons before baptism, the church agrees. That's why you have to pass that step. You might say, well, I'm a Christian. I don't care what the church says. This passage is teaching completely contrary to that. It's the gathering of the church that has that sort of authority. Okay, last thought. Again, I say to you, if you gather and agree about anything they ask... Now, what is this anything they ask? Is it literally anything? If I get together with my brother John here and we say, okay, what can we ask about? Well, it says anything. What is the context? 
Let me leave that question with you. I'd love to talk to you about it and hear what you have to think, what you, what you have to say after you've thought about it. What kind of asking is this is, is it talking about here? What are you asking for? Now, just remember, the church is a new entity. It's a new organism being shaped, being formed. There's all kinds of people coming into the church. And Christ is the one establishing the rules of how the church body lives. It's his word. That's the context of the passage. That's the meaning of the passage. I hope this was helpful to you. Uh, I hope it didn't confuse you even more. Here's what I often think. I think this sort of study approach kind of intimidates us. And we kind of left thinking, who's enough for these things? How in the world am I supposed to do this? Let me just encourage you that there is a way. And it takes time and it takes hard work. And I'm not saying I mastered it because I'm still learning how to study the Bible. But that's the key, folks, friends. The key is to have a learning, teachable, humble spirit when you approach God's word. And at no point shall we come before scripture and say, I have understood. I am finished. Amen? Amen. Uh, Let's pray to finish out the seminar. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we are humbled by your word. Father, we ask for wisdom. Lord, we ask for humility. We ask for being teachable. Father, mend our hearts. Change our hearts. Open our eyes to see Jesus more clearly in Scripture. Help us to see you more, Father. Help us to love your word. And we ask that you would please help your word be more understandable to us. Father, I pray that you would bless my brothers and sisters who are gathered here. I hope that this information, this time that we had together, Lord, that it would be helpful in any way. Father, we ask that you would continue to bless us in this day as now we are going to break and then we're going to come back together to worship you one more time again. We praise you. We bow before you. Amen.